So today we're going to be talking about Love 7, Throat and culture, Urine Cultures. Uh, later on Thursday I'll be discussing your unknown project and we will be starting the unknown project. So make sure you take a look at the unknown project instructions file on Canvas. Um, what will I do? I think I might uh, send you on Thursday. Maybe I might even send it to you today. And that is uh, your unknown number and tell you you're going to get started with the culture. So maybe that will be my goal, try and get that done today. Um, but uh, we'll talk about it on Thursday. Any questions about what we're doing? Next Thursday, we won't have a lab itself, although Lab 7 is a little longer than most of the other labs. Lab 9 is the longest lab. It's quite a bit bigger, but it's the only lab we'll be doing next week. And from now on, other than Lab 9, you will be finishing your infectious disease project, and that's due uh, January 14th. Hopefully you're well along on it. And you're going to be working on your unknown project. That will be due July 21st. I'll talk more about how you're going to do that project on Thursday. So any question about the lab? If not, let's talk about lab 7. And we'll go to 345. Let me share the screen. Come on. And let's go to the lab. So throat and urine cultures, please read the textbook if you haven't already done that. Um, or the B beta hemolytic streptococci, you can read the text at the end of this file. And also the same for hemophilus, meaning you don't have anything in your custom textbook. You have the complete textbook, you can read about these. So the learning objective, explain how to properly collect throat and urine specimens for routine culture, list common bacterial pathogens isolated from the throat and the urine, uh, know the media used to grow these pathogens, and I will ask specific questions about that, so do know that. Recognize which tests are used to identify throat and urine pathogens, meaning when you have something growing up, you can run different tests to identify the bacteria. So know the tests we use on throat and urine pathogens. Understand the principles and how to interpret the following tests. The catalase test, the XV factor testing, coagulase test, and the oxidase test. Once specimens are received in the laboratory, they're logged and processed in a timely fashion. Specific culture media and in, are inoculated and incubated, and that is how we obtain throat and urine specimens. Below is an overview of the media used to cultivate common pathogens isolated from the throat and urine cultures. So, from the throat, we use two culture medias, particularly blood auger and that can isolate Streptococcus pyogenes from the throat. But we can also uh, use chocolate auger, and that's specifically for growing uh, Haemophilus influenzae, which is commonly isolated from the throat of children, especially young children. Not so much of adults, but uh, especially children. For urine, uh, generally, they grow the specimens up on blood auger, but they also grow, uh, meaning they streak it on blood auger, but they'll also streak it on McConkie's auger or EMB auger. 
eosine, methylene blue. And the reason for doing two plates is that blood auger will grow everything. But usually the in infective agent uh, that we get in a urine specimen is uh, an enterobacteriaceae. And so we grow it on McConkie's and methylene blue to get rid of uh, the gram-positive bacteria. Uh, another possible uh, species that can be isolated from the urine is also Pseudomonas, and it will grow on McConkie's and EMB as well. Any question about any of that? Some gram-positives that can be uh, causing a urine or urinary tract infection would be streptococcus, enterococcus, especially staphylococcus. Can you speak up a little bit? It's hard to hear you. Okay. I'll turn this up, see if that helps. Is that any better? It's giving like a feedback. It's giving you feedback? Yep. Is that better? Well, I'll yeah. just... Yes, all right. Um, I'll try and get a little closer to the microphone and see if that helps. All right. Move that over. So for throat, throat cultures, we usually will do a throat culture on a patient that has a sore throat. And simply a sore throat would not be good enough for colonizing or testing for bacteria because most sore throats are actually caused by viruses. But if you see white patches on an inflamed tonsil, then that is indicative that the sore throat might be caused by a bacterial pathogen, especially Streptococcus pyogenes also called group A strep. I will use the term streptococcus pyogenes. So a sore throat is probably not bacterial, but if you see white spots on the th sore throat, then that indicates it's likely bacteria. Any question there? A strep throat caused by Streptococcus pyogenes is the most commonly isolated cause of uh, a bacterial infection in the throat. And to get a uh, bacterial sample from the patient, you need to swab the back of the throat or the tonsils. So this region and this region, you do not want to get the uh, uh, tongue or the sides of the mouth. The mouth is a very filthy specimen and it has a lot of bacteria in it and so if your uh, swab were to touch the tongue or the sides of the mouth you may not get the pathogen. The easiest thing to do is just to say ah and hold the tongue depressor to keep the tongue out and then go way back in the throat and rub it against the tonsils or the back of the throat. Uh, patients that test positive to Streptococcus pyogenes are placed on antibiotic therapy to get rid of the Streptococcus pyogenes because generally speaking this organism cannot be thrown off by a patient. Any question about that? And so before the development of antibiotic, uh, Streptococcus pyogenes caused a lot of health problems in America. Uh, scarlet fever. I can't remember what the name of that was. The bacteria would get into the blood and then would do damage to the heart. Fortunately now, those diseases are very rare because uh, when a patient has a sore throat for a long time, the parents, usually if it's a kid, but they'll go into the doctor and there'll be tests for strep throat, and when it comes back, they put them on antibiotic. Uh, Streptococcus pyogenes is fastidious. 
So you have to use a culture media supplemented with 5% sheep's blood. And that means you use a black BAP plate, blood auger plates. And then what you're looking for is for very small, clear colonies surrounded by a complete zone of hemolysis. And that's what uh, uh, Streptococcus pyogenes causes on the blood auger plate to specifically identify Streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, besides growing on blood plate and seeing the beta hemolysis, you then do two biochemical tests that are all you need to show that it's caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. And that's the catalase test and the basitracin susceptibility test. So here Quick we question. have blood. Yes? Uh, if you back up a little bit, it said that it incubates in a CO2 chamber? Uh, uh, CO2 yeah, incubator? Streptococcus pyogenes doesn't like growing in normal air. It does better in a chamber that has four or five percent CO2 added. Uh, but that doesn't make it necessarily an anaerobe, right? No, that's not an anaerobe. It's growing in 20 percent oxygen, but it has more CO2 added to the plate. I mean to the air. Um, in tissue culture, I did a lot of that, but that was mainly to keep the pH of the media correct, meaning the CO2 was needed to keep the pH of the media correct. Uh, I'm not sure why Streptococcus pyogenes grows better in a plate where CO2 is added. I have to look that up, okay? But uh, this is a human pathogen that grows in the body although it's in the throat, so you wouldn't think there'd be a lot of CO2 there. But when we breathe out, we do breathe out about 4% CO2. So that would be my guess for why this organism likes to have CO2 added to the incubator. Okay? Uh, here we're looking at a blood auger plate, and as you can see, it's mostly uh, no hemolysis around that plate. Let's blow it up a little bit. Uh, there might be some, uh, a little bit of alpha hemolysis, but there's no there. And here you can see complete hemolysis where the little dot is Streptococcus pyogenes, and then the big clearing which looks like a colony, but it's not. That's actually a, a beta hemolysis, complete hemoly hemo hemolysis of the blood in this region. Any question about that? I guess I want to blow it up a little bit more. So you take uh, the growth that you isolate from these plates, and then you test it for catalase. And catalase is an enzyme produced by most bacteria if they're grown in the air, and it converts hydrogen peroxide in the presence of catalase into water and oxygen. Because of the production of oxygen, you see bubbling when catalase is present. Okay? So this is an organism that when we have hydrogen peroxide here and we add the bacteria, there's no bubbling there. So that's catalase negative. And this is catalase positive. Let me blow that up a little bit where you can see the bubbles. Okay. Any questions about the catalase test? Streptococcus pyogenes tests negative for catalase production. So it grows in the air, but it's catalase negative. And that's one of the tests you need to show that this organism is Streptococcus pyogenes. The other test is the base and susceptibility test. You uh, streak out the bacteria on a blood auger plate, 
So you make this grow in a lawn of bacteria, and then you put a, uh, a base of trace and disk. It has, uh, you don't need to know the units, but it's 0 0.04 units of base of tracing on the disk. And if you have a zone of inhibition around the disk, that means it's uh, 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 Streptococcus pyogenes. Because the other beta hemolytic bacteria are resistant to basitracin. Okay? Any question there? So those are the two tests you need to show that your blood agar plate has Streptococcus pyogenes on it. Alright? Another organism that can be isolated from the throat, especially from children, is Haemophilus influenzae. It's a common cause of ear, eye, and sinus infections in babies and young children. It's fastidious, but it does not lyse blood. So a blood auger plate, it will not grow if that's the only thing you have on the plate, Haemophilus influenzae. You can see, let me blow that up, here is blood auger plate, and what they did is they streaked the blood auger plate this way. That's why we have this marking here on the plate. And then they streaked in a single line uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus causes hemolysis, which isn't shown very well on this plate. But the, the uh, um, Haemophilus influenzae grows in the streak right here where uh, Staphylococcus aureus is causing the blood to lice in this region. Okay? And I won't ask you about doing that, but what you can do for growing Haemophilus influenzae is to grow it on a chocolate auger plate where the blood has been lysed because the blood cells are added to hot law auger and the heat of the auger just lyses the blood. And then you streak out Haemophilus influenzae on the plate, and it can grow. Any questions? So the Haemophilus influenzae needs things from the blood, but it can't get it from a blood auger plate because Haemophilus influenzae does not lyse the blood itself, and that's why we grow it on a chocolate auger plate. Any questions about that? All right, if not, let's talk about uh, urine cultures. Uh, urine cultures are used to diagnose and uh, eventually treat urinary tract infections associated with cystitis, that's inflammation of the cyst, urethritis, inflammation of the urethra, and polynephritis. Normally, the urine in the bladder is sterile, and that's not exactly true, because we know that there's bacteria in the female bladder, at least. Uh, but bacteria can travel to the bladder, to the urethra, and that can cause a urinary tract infection. Females are much more likely to get a urinary tract infection than males, simply because their urethra is shorter. To sample the uh, urethra or the urine, uh, the genital area must be clean prior to collection. And generally, they use the clean catch midstream, which involves only collecting the middle portion of the urine stream, meaning you don't collect the start because there will be more bacteria from the urethra and then you collect the middle, which will have less bacteria from the urethra and more from the bladder, and you don't collect the end either. So that reduces the cultivation of organisms from the urethra. There are other things you can do, such as catheterization, directly stick the probe 
catheter up into the urethra and then sample the uh, urine there. You're less likely to get bacteria there. And in an even more invasive, the suprapubic aspiration, where you stick a needle into the bladder through the, I don't know what that's called, the abdomen, and uh, directly pull up the uh, fluid in the bladder. <clears throat> Why would that be used over a catheter? Sorry, can you say that again? Why would a suprapubic aspiration be used over a catheter? Uh, I'm not an MD, so I'm not sure why they would use that over a catheter. Uh, this is <clears throat> more invasive, <clears throat> but this is the purest way. Generally, when you put the needle directly into the bladder, you're only going to be sampling from the fluid in the bladder. Whereas when you're putting the catheter up the urethra and into the bladder, you can pick up bacteria in the catheter by touching the urethra. Now you're less likely to get bacteria than taking directly from mid-catch of the urine, but still you can pick up uh, bacteria in the catheter. So if you're really wanting to know and you want to reduce essentially all risk of contamination, you use the suprapubic aspiration method. Okay? All right, any questions about that? All right. So how you test that is you put only 0 0.001 milliliter. That is one one thousandth of a milliliter of urine onto a non-selective media, such as a blood auger plate, using an inoculation loop. Additionally, you grow up uh, the bacteria collect from the urine with on a, a gram negative. Well, excuse me. You you want to grow gram negative bacilli on a McConkie's plate or an eosine methylene blue plate because frequently coliforms are the bacteria that are most likely to be growing in the bladder. Especially E. coli. Uh, is there any reason why I need to say why? Uh, you have a lot of E. coli coming out of your feces, and that's not too terribly far away from the urethra. And so uh, E. coli is frequently a bacteria you find growing in the bladder. And it's not supposed to grow in the bladder, and it causes urinary tract infection if it's growing in the bladder. All right, any questions about that? So when you're testing the urine, you normally grow it on a blood auger plate as well as either McConkie's or EMB plate. Uh, how you get exactly 0 0.001 milliliters of, of urine on the plate is you use a loop like this that you just dip it in the urine and that volume held on that loop is 0 0.001 milliliters and then you streak it on a plate usually blood auger plate and then streak it down the loop that way i'm not sure why you do it that way but uh, and then you grow up the plate and if you have a lot of one bacteria in the urine then that's probably the bacteria that is causing the urinary tract infection and because that's streaked out on a MAC plate, we can see that not only is this essentially one bacteria that's causing the urinary tract infection, but it's also a gram-negative bacilli that's fermenting the sugar lactose, which is shown from the McConkie's plate. Do I need to explain that? It's growing on McConkie's, so it's gram-negative. 
probably an enteric because it has bile salts in the McConkeys, although that's and not because it ferments the sugar sorry. lactate. Sorry. And because it's and because it ferments the sugar. Yeah. It, it changes the pH color. Correct. I hadn't talked about that. And then it's uh, uh, fermenting the sugar lactose because it's pink in color, the growth. So the interpretation of a urine culture uh, technique, it's multifaceted. Many factors have to be considered, such as the type of collection. Now, when you're collecting mid-catch stream, from somebody avoiding urine, you're expecting to see uh, more bacteria and contaminating bacteria from the urethra. So you won't get only one species growing. There will be several species growing. And you'll probably see more bacteria because, well, the urethra has bacteria. But uh, if you're doing it from the catheter, there should be less bacteria. And then if you're doing it from the suprapubic aspiration, there should only be bacteria directly from the bladder, assuming it was done properly. Uh, the gender of the patient will also affect the numbers that generally females have more bacteria than males. And to tell you the truth, I'm not sure why that's the case. Uh, because the males have a longer urethra, so you'd think they might have more contamination from the urethra, but it's actually not the case. Uh, the number of colonies you see in the urine depends on, on how you determine what your culture is. And the presence of polymicrobial growth, meaning the more old organisms you see, the poorer the collection specimen. If you only have one organism, that's probably the organism causing the urinary tract infection. Okay? All right, any questions about that? So some tests you run once you get your bacteria growing from a urinary tract infection. The first one is the coagulase test. The coagulase test is looking for the production of the enzyme coagulase, and that's used to differentiate Staphylococcus aureus from other Staphylococcus species. Staphylococcus aureus contains the enzyme coagulase, which coagulates fibrinogen uh, into fibrin, which will put a clot around the bacteria and then protect the bacteria from the host immune system. So that clot, although it's walling off the bacteria, it's protecting the bacteria from the host immune system. And Staphylococcus aureus can produce that protective clot because it has the enzyme coagulase. Any question about that? Uh, the other staphylococcal species do not have the enzyme coagulase, and so their cells can be eaten by the immune system cells, like a white blood cell. Uh, what happens is fibrinogen, which you can get in uh, blood or in plasma, uh, coagulase will clot it and convert it into a fibrin clot. Uh, the rapid coagulase test, you have the uh, uh, serum on a slide and an organism that you put into it. Uh, you, you drop the plasma onto the slide. It has rabbit blood in it. And uh, you put the bacteria in and let it sit. And a negative bacteria causes no clots. Clots, uh, a bacteria that produce coagulase will cause clumping or clotting of the, uh, on the slide. You can also do it in the tube, and uh, the negative bacteria don't cause any clumping because they do not have the enzyme coagulase, but coagulase will cause the blood to clot, or the, uh, not the blood, but the, 
What do you call that? The plasma. Okay, any questions about coagulase? The most common bacteria isolated from a urine culture is E. coli. That's in the family Enterobacteriaceae, and that's why we grow urine specimens on a McConkie's plate or a uh, EMB plate because they can select against gram positives, and then the E. coli or other Enterobacteriaceae can grow on those plates. Any question about that? We're actually not doing any tests for E. coli because that will be done, tests for E. coli will be done in lab nine. So we'll do that test next week. Uh, a test that you can do is that another organism that's frequently found in urinary tract infections is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas belongs to the family Pseudomonaceae, which is similar to the family Enteriobacteriaceae in that it's a gram-negative bacillus causing urinary tract infections, but it's different in that it has cytochrome C in it because it performs uh, um, the electron transport chain of, of aerobic respiration, which we talked about earlier in the lecture. And you can use the oxidase test to test for the presence of cytochrome C. And Pseudomonas has cytochrome C, so it'll test oxidase positive. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a bacterial pathogen which can cause urinary tract infections and you can grow that up and then test that bacteria <clears throat> for oxidase positive test. And uh, if the bacteria produce oxidase, then they have cytochrome C and you'll get this bluish color from the oxidase test. So this region was exposed to the oxidase reagents and this region became a blue or purplish. Any question about the oxidase test? So in summary, urine and throat cultures are two common types of specimens received in the laboratory for bacterial tests and microbiologists are trained to isolate and identify these pathogens that cause urinary and uh, throat uh, infections. Okay, you're not physically going to be performing any of these activities. However, you will be responsible for knowing how to perform them. And you'll be needing to understand the principles used to detect the various enzymes in the test. So you've got some videos to watch on the catalase test, and then you'll have a virtual interactive laboratory exercise. You'll also have the same, a video clip, and then a virtual interactive laboratory exercise on running the coagulase test, and then a video on the oxidase test, and a virtual interactive laboratory exercise. Read through the questions, don't fill them out here. Go look up on the uh, worksheet for Lab 7, put in your answers, and then submit this file. And this is meant to be an easy way for you to get points. If you don't know the answer for a question, you can just look it up, or you can ask someone, you can ask me, I will provide you with the answer. I'm not going to provide all of them, but if you have a question on one of them, I will provide the answers. Okay? So I'll be here until 345. If any of you have questions on your lab, please ask me. All right?